nationalisme, c'est la guerre. أنتم حياة فإن شاهدتكم حضرات أنتم حياة فإن شاهدتكم حضارات وإن وإن حجبتم تغيب الروح عن جسدي جبتم تغيب الروح عن جسدي الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا تحيرت فيكم لا إله إلا الله سلوى يعانكم 
وإن رمت باسطا خيفت سلوايا عنكم لا إله إلا الله الله Amsterdam Andalusian Orchestra, thank you so much. Dwight, um, I'd just like to ask you a question because I understand uh, there are much more of you in, uh, in total in this orchestra. That's true. Uh, I think more than seven, uh, the composition changes uh, from time to time. And this is, in a way, a special occasion because one of your guests, in a way, is originally from Morocco. Yes, he is uh, originally from uh, Morocco, from uh, Tanja. And uh, uh, I don't know if uh, everyone knows, but this month is the Ramadan, and he is here now in uh, in Amsterdam to uh, recite in uh, one of the mosques in uh, Amsterdam. And uh, we already worked with him uh, some other times, and uh, and now he he joined us here to uh, to uh, to play this music. And what is the music you play? Because of course we we see and we hear, but what is it about? Well, this, uh, this type of music we played is uh, Sufi mu music, if I can uh, name like a big, a big name for, for this thing. And uh, uh, it's about, uh, about God, the love of God. Many of the poems that, uh, that we sing are uh, maybe a thousand years old. They are, they are very old. Uh, but they still sing these songs uh, uh, like it's uh, from today. And many of the songs, if you if you if you read the poems, they are about about love. So sometimes you see a poem and it's it's a Sufi poem, but and, and you read it and you don't necessarily see that it's it's a religious text. But in the Sufi tradition, you uh, you use this to uh, to come to a higher stage of uh, uh, of spirituality and and love with with your Creator or uh, whatever it may be. So that's the, that's the the songs we uh, we will sing today, especially because it's uh, the Ramadan. So we we try to stay into in the how do you say that in the <laughs> in the spirit in the in the sphere in the in the ambience of of the Ramadan. Yes, that's one. Well, thank you so much. Um, you will be uh, in the middle of the program again with one song, and then at the end. Yeah. So we will uh, we will see you back in the program. Okay, thank you so much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome here today in uh, one of the, uh, the sessions of uh, Foreign uh, on European Culture. It was founded uh, two years ago by the Bali and Dutch Culture, and it's already the second edition. And this year's theme, you've already seen it, is Act for Democracy. And yesterday the forum opened in the City Theatre, our Stad Schouwburg, among others with the speech of uh, Santiago Sierra, and it will continue until uh, Sunday. So feel uh, free and invited to, uh, to go to other uh, meetings and, uh, and programs as well. Because for four days, uh, a, a very interesting gathering of artists, philosophers, journalists and politicians from all over the world, uh, it's not only uh, from Europe, are here in Amsterdam to discuss uh, the Europe's uh, challenges we face today. Um, think also about uh, the future of, uh, of Europe in a 
quite crucial point of existence. Over next year, there will be European elections, and we face, of course, uh, the situation with the Brexit, and we face uh, all the developments around the borders of Europe. And that makes uh, the question, what is Europe's identity about? And in a way, our identity has been formed for a long, long time as an open uh, society on uh, an open tradition to change and exchange a lot of other cultures and elements of those cultures. And today, however, we see that we start to build fences again uh, around Europe and that there are perceptions of cultures across the Mediterranean and that they are seen as perspectives as being negative. And besides that, Europe is often depicted as an old continent with still a sort of colonial mindset. Uh, whereas the Arab world is by too many framed as a conservative and extremist society. And these are just the cliches, and we want to work beyond those black and white images. So today's debate takes place against the background of how we can bridge the perception gap and foster mutual understanding, and what can be the role of museums in this debate. Because culture is a driver of understanding, and museums are the sort of mirrors of our society. So Dutch culture and the Bali have brought together a distinguished panel of speakers from uh, Arabic and European museums. They are curators, they are thinkers and builders of museum concepts here in the 21st century. And we see both in the Arab world new museum concepts uh, coming at stage. We see Western museums who are increasingly looking to branch out to the Arab world. And at the same time, we, see, we also see a growing interest for Arab art in Europe. So what does this mean for the role the museum directors and curators has to play? And what is the role museums itself has in, have in society? And in what way do exhibitions capture developments? And how can we broaden, in a way, our mindset? All those questions uh, are well being uh, discussed in our panel. And that brings me with, uh, uh, to our keynote speaker, the distinguished Vreem Fada. And we were really happy to have her. She is an independent curator. She's based in Ramallah. And she's a key figure in the international art scene over the last years. She has involved, uh, been involved in many international exhibitions, and she won in 2017 the Walter Hobbs Award for Curatorial Achievement. And I quote the jury report because of her impressive record of organizing groundbreaking programs, both inside and outside of conventional museums. Previously, she has worked at the Guggenheim as an associate curator of Middle Eastern art and as the director of the Palestinian Association for Contemporary Art. And give her a very big hand. Reem Farah. Okay. okay. I'm going to sit down <laughs> and be comfortable. Um, I have 10 minutes, so this is going to be a short presentation. Oh, it, shall I stand or sit? Can I sit? I'll sit. You can sit. It's okay, fine. perfect. <laughs> um, I, I was invited to come and present on my work previously in museums. Uh, and uh, as our moderator kindly has uh, mentioned, I've worked with the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi project. And uh, I've also recently worked with the Palestinian Museum in uh, Ramallah, where I did the inaugural exhibition, Jerusalem Lives. I have a PowerPoint, uh, which I'll just put on. I think it goes on. Here we go. And it should just loop, I hope. Um, so um, you'll see images in the back. And I hope you can uh, see from the gist of what I'm saying, it'll address the images of what I'm about to speak. So I'm obsessing with an idea. And uh, in, in terms of this kind of question about how, uh, how do we bridge cultures? And I think there's an even more potent um, question that we're, we're, I'm kind of coming to terms with. And I've always been obsessed with this idea of materiality. Um, study, through my studies in philosophy or Benjaminian studies in philosophy in particular, I've always been really anchored on what does this mean, this materiality? But then we're in, we're in the face of also seeing the, the abstraction of people into numbers. We face this idea of people dying. And then at the same time, 
how do we salvage the object of art? And I'm trying to find a, a bridge in my mind about how, how do these two things come together? And then how do we answer that in a museum? Or how do we intuitively work in this kind of, in this map of things? Um, and my first question um, in, in this idea of materiality or trying to uh, absolve the artwork is I think it's very important to understand that there is a condensation or there is also a distillation happening of ideas um, in artists to salvage this idea of materiality. Uh, the same materiality that is now being abstracted from humanity itself, from the human being itself. And I think this is something that is quite important for us to reckon with. So the narratives, the stories, the ideas are all in that piece of an artwork. And it's not just contemplation. When you look at an artwork, there is a study. There is an intuitive, materialistic relationship that happens between bodies. And I think this is something that I'm trying to come at and arrive at in terms of my relationship with the artwork or how I salvage that. And if I were to think about these kind of distilled histories and stories and bodies and ideas in this humanity of ways in the artwork, then I think about how the, the let's say the portrayal of all of that in a gallery, in a museum, becomes ever more, um, let's say, pertinent in how we see things and study things. So for the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi and what you have, you're seeing in this uh, kind of demonstrative, these demonstrative slides is just one, uh, one gallery space in terms of the collection building where I was very much involved. Um, and uh, we were thinking about how do we bring in a collection of stories uh, for a museum of the 21st century, all these kind of grandiose statements, in the middle of the Middle East, which is with an international name like the Guggenheim. Um, how does it begin to tell the story from the Arab world, from the Middle Eastern perspective, onto a global audience in an international framework? This is a huge thing. I th this is not a facile thing. This is not something that we've seen before in a museum anywhere. These are all the stories you've not heard. You've not witnessed materialistically. And witnessing them materialistically is really what matters today. Because it's enough of seeing numbers. It's enough of seeing images that fleet on TV in news. That is not something that you build empathy with. It's not enough. So imagine going into a museum where you see the narratives of art historians, of artists, of thinkers, uh, like Hassan Sharif from the Group Five in, in the Emirates, who really thought of very radical ideas about his own existen existential, existentialism, his body, his humanity in the middle of the ideas of the desert and modernity and what's happening in the UAE. Hassan Sharif, who influenced other artists like Hamad Kadhim, like Abdullah Saadi, and you're seeing these images in the back. This corresponds to other group artists like Group Zero from Germany, through others like Arte Povera in Italy. This is not, um, this is not a culture that speaks to uh, being subsumed under other various cultures. There's something there that becomes, let's say, reciprocal. It becomes something of a conversation, which is absolutely essential at this time to understand that we're beyond the, we're the worlds of hierarchies. We're beyond that. We're, we're trying to decolonize the, this moment into trying to find reciprocity and to find equilibriums and presentations and discussions of stories and narratives. Um, so this material, these material objects, these witnesses of history are saying a lot more. And they're hopefully carrying with them a weight that says a lot more. Um, in my experience working, you'll see now in the images that come right after this, uh, I've worked uh, at the Palestinian Museum, as I've mentioned. And uh, I was invited after a long period of time, having lived in New York, to come back and uh, do the inaugural exhibition, which 
they said to me, you have to work on Jerusalem. As a Palestinian, you know, this is the opening exhibition of the Palestinian Museum. You have to work on Jerusalem. Mind you, I don't even like Jerusalem. And, uh, and I can't even visit Jerusalem. So it's not, it's, but then Jerusalem is something else. It's not for me to like or hate or have a personal relationship or be in it. And that's this kind of abstracted idea that I had to like contend with about the city. And the most important kind of idea for me, and this is where I'm trying to tie in back together, which is the city is the lives of people. It's human beings. It's not me to judge or like or want, it's bodies. It's this kind of body, these materiality is what makes up that city. And that's what's the most important thing to take into consideration. Um, I started in my kind of curatorial thesis, I decided I'm gonna deal with an idea and I hope this resonates for this idea of Europe today. Uh, and this was the message behind this exhibition, which is um, the idea that I started with a thesis, a metaphorical thesis, of course this is not academic in any way. Uh, it's very intuitive. And I said that glob 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 globalism or globality started in Jerusalem and it dies in Jerusalem, basically. So what we witnessed in this idea of globalization began maybe 50 years ago because this is this, the, the onset of universalisms. This is the place where humanity was trying to think about how to be universal, how to be for everyone, open, all the religions, etc. And this is the place which is the most fraught in its kind of global reality, and it's a prison. And guess what? We've all accepted for it to be a prison. So let's take responsibility. If Jerusalem is a prison with borders, with checkpoints on every entry, with a wall, separation wall around everywhere, let's contend with that reality and let's understand that because of that, because of those realities, because of this idea of a security uh, um, rationale, uh, because of militarism, because of this idea of defense, because of all of these things, because lives don't matter, because bodies don't matter, then this is the reality that we will have to accept Brexit in Europe, where we have to accept border polic polic policies, where we have to accept that people become numbers, because this is what we have contended with in Jerusalem itself. And of course, this is a very large statement and how do you subsume that in an exhibition? Um, and do you? Well, you know, this is again my story. This is, these are my ideas, and this is how I try to condense them. But what you're seeing here is my way of always ending with a little bit of a positive, with, you know, art, <laughs> which is art. I, I mean, someone asked me yesterday, a wonderful journalist asked me from Faye about, you know, what it is in art. I said, it's hope. Imagine if I made an exhibition where I told the Palestinians who can't go anywhere but to this museum that their life is basically shit. <laughs> it's, it's, or bleak, or there's no way. It's, it's kind of also, uh, that would be very unfortunate. So I anchored myself on artists, on their materiality. I invited them and I told them that they had the lands of the museum. It's not just the space inside. And we've all seen sculptural gardens, et cetera, but th this really does not exist in Palestine. There's a lot of things that don't exist. And I wanted that experience from artists, local and international, to come and do these wonderful commissions, permanent and temporary, in the gardens of the museum. And this was my kind of way to say, you know, this is what Jerusalem is. It's open, it's the land, it's nature, it's not restrictive. There are no borders, and it represents everyone. It's not just for the Jewish state. It's not just for the Palestinian state. It's for everyone, and it's colorful, and it's abstract, and it's material, and it's most importantly representing human bodies and human lives. Thank you very much. Uh, should I stay? Oh, I Rin, thank you so much, and let me introduce uh, the other members of uh, this panel. panel. Um, 
Salama Al Shamsi. Um, she is uh, from the Sayyad National Museum program. She is the manager, uh, and uh, uh, her main role is to manage both to build and design and the design aspects of the museum, but also, of course, uh, the program and the collection, which is currently in uh, development. Um, she works on the permanent collection of the museum, the production of exhibitions, and uh, she also gives public talks and workshops to deliver the mission and vision of the, the museum. Uh, Salama Al Shamsi. And let me also introduce uh, Juliette Singer. Juliette Singer? Singer? Singer. Singer. She is the chief curator <laughs> in charge of the modern and contemporary arts at Louvre Abu Dhabi. It's an honor that you are here. She has been involved in the project for several years, working uh, at Agans France Museum. And uh, you prepared uh, the opening of the LAD, uh, and you have also been in charge of work from the 19th to 21st uh, century. And before that, she worked in several museums in France. So, Juliette Singer. Um, you also prepared, I think, a little introduction of yes. your museum. I think that's an important thing, and I think, Juliette, you're going to do the same, because a lot of people know some sort of average images, general images, sure. but it's good that you introduced uh, your museum, so please. Great. I prefer to stand up <laughs> when I present, and then I'll sit back when we discuss. Yeah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think our moderator uh, gave a, an amazing presentation, so I'll start immediately. So, until today, the history of museums have been based on the collections of kings, from cabinets of curiosities to private collections of power and influence, populating castles and homes with objects representing their worldly exploits. The museum of the 21st century finds itself in a place of compromise, where the models of the time it was created no longer apply in a world that is competing for resources and knowledge. In the United Arab Emirates, our collections are based on rich traditions, oral histories, and the wisdom passed on to us from our ancestors for us to proudly share with the rest of the world. We have become agile and creative with the way we approach new models in the 21st century and knowledge for the world. On the global museum stage, we have made advances and become the pioneers of purpose-built museums, reinventing the concept of a museum and the typologies and models of museums. So just a little bit of the context, and this is the map of the world, and the box down is the United Arab Emirates, and then this is an island within Abu Dhabi. It's called the Saadiyat Cultural District. And to point on, this is the Zayed National Museum. And this is the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi that three mentioned. And then this is the Louvre Abu Dhabi that my colleague Juliette will give you a brief on. So the Zayed National Museum has been founded in the spirit of Sheikh Zayed, who's our founding father, who developed the United Arab Emirates in 1971 and his works and the re-owned warmth that he extended to people from all backgrounds and all walks of life. It is a place that we will commit safeguarding his legacy for future generations. It is the one place that captures all of our history in all its multiple dimensions, history, intangible culture, heritage, anthropology, and the philosophy of being Emirati. It will be a public and civic hub for the study and advancement of natural history. And most importantly, and to touch upon the uh, subject of today's uh, program is that the Zion National Museum will illustrate the historic role of the UAE as a crossroads for culture linked through trade, cultural exchange, and diplomacy to the wider region for thousands and thousands of years. It will exhibit our ancient ar and archaeological treasures, making a proud statement to those who don't know that our history started since the Neolithic ages and that we are one of the most enduring and preserving civilizations in the world. The Zayed National Museum continues the legacy of Sheikh Zayed, who had commissioned the first museum in 1969 to preserve the archaeology that was found in Abu Dhabi. These are the values of the museum, but also these are global and universal values that everyone resonates to and uh, relates to. The collection of Zayed National Museum. The collection will range across art, historical, archaeological material, ethnography, antiquity, scientific and social history material, as well as contemporary commissions, and of course, media assets. 
The sources of collection will consist of acquisitions from private market or private from market or private sales, retail trade, donations and commissions, and will also welcome private and public donations as well as loans from both local and international institutions. The building is designed by Lord Norman Foster from the United Kingdom, and the concept was inspired by the dynamic of flight and the feathers of the falcon that reflects and creates the iconic symbol of the United Arab Emirates, which is the national symbol of the UAE. It is designed to minimize energy by usage, energy usage by incorporating natural ventilation and lighting the five towers using heat exchange technologies, which is a technology that was used by Emirati in the older houses in the early 20th century. So they're bringing, bringing back history into modern buildings as well. These are sort of um, things that you'll see as soon as you enter to the museum. We want to make a statement that the UAE had uh, archaeological material and these uh, tombs dates back 3,000 or 5,000 years ago from Healy tombs and from Omanar, uh, Omanar tombs as well. This is a picture of Abu Dhabi that was illustrated by a historian. It is Abu Dhabi 8, 8 million years ago. And then these are some evidences that Abu Dhabi looked like that. So the, the, this is an amazing, uh, I call giant elephant with four tusks which went extinct. And this image here is an evidence of, of this, uh, the name of, the scientific name of this creature is Tecatetrabalodon. It took me two months to memorize the name. <laughs> <laughs> so these are actually the tracks of the Tecatetrabalodon. And you can see these are the different uh, tracks of the females. And guess who's that? It's a male. <laughs> So <laughs> these are also evidences of bones from crocodiles. So these are also evidences that there were rivers in the middle of the deserts. These are also tools and had access to also that dates back to millions of years ago evidences. This is an irrigation system, an ancient irrigation system with this back to 5,000 years ago. That was found in the Lain city in Abu Dhabi. And these are of course all bronze material because uh, one of the longest um, uh, let's say uh, one of the longest periods was the Bronze Age in the United Arab Emirates. So these are the sort of stories that you want to tell in the museum. Of course, the pearl is a very important resource in the United Arab Emirates. And this image here, which is a water, uh, watercolor, from Mughal watercolor, depicts beautiful pearls hanging from the canopy of the Shah. And he himself is wearing also beautiful necklaces, a necklace filled with pearls which was brought from uh, the region of the Gulf. This here is a necklace that dates back to the 1890, and it was gifted by our founding father, Sheikh Zayed, to a renowned singer, Um Kalthoum, who is Egyptian. So this itself is bridging cultures. And this necklace was made in 1890. This photo was taken in 1972. The pearls were taken from the Gulf region, made in India, given to an Egyptian singer by a UAE president. So this story is itself is a very strong one when we want to answer the, the question of how do we bridge cultures and museums. And of course, the first inhabitants of the United Arab Emirates, and then evidences of uh, finding them in tombs and what they used to wear. And then of course, this is a beautiful uh, site in Meleha and Abu Dhabi. And these are obeyed pots that, was, that were found uh, in that site. The first uh, mention of the region uh, and uh, the ancient name of the region of the United Arab Emirates was called Magan, and the name came from the shapes, which is uh, a depiction of a boat that looked like an M. So because they used to be sailors and used to go by coast and travel by coast and trade, so that's why the name came from the shape of the boat, which is an M, and they called that region Magan. Of course, how, how, how did this is a depiction of, um, it is from uh, the King Ashnabarpol from uh, Assyria, one of the palaces in Assyria, and I'm very, very uh, proud to say that this was, this fragment is from the collection of Zayed National Museum, and it was taken from the last um, standing uh, palace in Assyria, um, and we're lucky to have it in our collection. This is also kind of preserving culture, and the, the story that is written here that this, this king traveled once from that region to uh, the Gulf, from Assyria to the Gulf. And of course, similarities between different cultures and, uh, and the different depictions that 
there, there was a connection long time ago, thousands and thousands of years ago. <clears throat> and then we also talk about the different religions and the different beliefs that were in the United Arab Emirates. Of course, there were many religions before Islam came. This, for example, is a pagan temple in Umm al Qiwain, one of the emirates in the, uh, the United Arab Emirates. And this is a monastery church in Abu Dhabi and uh, Sir Banias Island. And uh, um, these fragments are from the monastery. And uh, Sheikh Zayed, our president himself, in 1971, uh, gave directives that this should be preserved. And I'm, uh, I'm very happy to say that this site will be open this year in Abu Dhabi. So when you come to Abu Dhabi, there will be a beautiful visitor center there, and everyone is welcome to visit. These are also other sorts of collections that we have. Our colleagues at the Louvre Rabadi have, have a similar page from the Blue Quran, of course, because of its significance. So every uh, national or universal museum, I think, I believe, should have a folio of that Blue Quran in their collection. And then we enter into the modern history. This, this is the early 20th century. So this is Sheikh Zayed in his early years with his tribe, and this is his mother, Sheikh Salama Butbuti. And we are, the role of women is very important in this museum and, and how those two women supported Sheikh Zayed. One is his mother, and the other one is Sheikh Fatma, who is his wife. How did they support him throughout his leadership? And, and how the mother affected him and, 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 uh, and uh, gave him the traits of leadership and being a very strong leader in, in that harsh environment and that harsh life. So these two women who affected uh, his, uh, his, uh, his leadership and his life. And then, of course, we come to the modern. This is the 1971, the unification of the United Arab Emirates. And then we talk about uh, different uh, intangible heritage. Uh, then you see the life of people of Emiratis and the different environments in the UAE, which is the desert, the oasis, the mountain, the coast, and the sea itself. So this is a beautiful family roasting coffee in the middle of the oasis. And this is a donation that we got from, uh, uh, from an elder woman who gave it to us. She said that she, her grandmother used to grind coffee in this. So every object we, we, uh, we accept in the museum has to have a story behind it. And then, of course, this is a woman next to a well getting water. The life was very hard. The life was harsh. And the, 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 the women were there to, to support the men throughout. Um, this is another piece that we have in our collection. It's a, they call it the General Maritime Treaty, which was signed on the shore of Ras al Khaimah, one of our northern emirates, in 1820 by the Gulf states and by the uh, uh, British um, uh, general. So basically, it says that there will be no slavery, there will be no war, and all of that. So it's a, um, a document which is very important for the history of the UAE as well. These are some, some, some tools that might not be familiar, but this is a tool that they use in a wild navigation to find the stars for, for, for the <laughs> divers or for the fishermen to find their way. And this is just a list of all of the different uh, pearl beds and where do they find pearls yeah. along the shore. Sorry. This is a diver who used to, um, my grandfather, I'm very proud to say, my grandfather was a pearl diver. And, and uh, he used to tell us amazing stories every time. And uh, they used to dive for, I don't know, without any oxygen, no equipment, nothing for a very long time. And they come up with a bunch of oysters, but from all of those oysters, maybe 1% of it would have a pearl. And then the harsh, the harsh life, and then the, the, the difficulty of this job, and then this is the result of it. A beautiful Cartier watch. So <laughs> actually, this is an image of Cartier himself with one of the uh, leaders in, uh, in Bahrain in the same region. And this is also within our collection. We want to show the juxtaposition of the harsh life of Emiratis in the early 20th century, but then the, the result of it and, and how those people left their families for months and months to find those pearls in, in order to earn their life. And of course, music and performances is a very also uh, important uh, topic. This is the family in the coast of Dubai. They are playing this uh, beautiful instrument, similar to a harp. And of course, the trade routes. And lastly, I just want to end with um, the intangible heritage and the UNESCO. And we have uh, around 16 sites in Al Ain inscribed in the World Heritage. And then we have around 11 
topics or themes inscribed in the, in the UNESCO, like coffee, uh, the majlis, uh, different uh, traditional performances. Uh, I just want to end with the importance of uh, what we're doing right now until we open the museum, but education, education, education is very important. And we, we reach out to children, to, to students and universities, to schools, to the community, to, to have them, to make them understand what will the content of their museum will be, of their national, national museum, and they will have to be our ambassadors for the future years. Thank you very much. Salama, thank you so much. Um, I think two beautiful examples of uh, building museums in the 21st century uh, in the, the Arab world um, from really bottom up, from based upon uh, the history and also the political uh, actual situation. Um, I think it's also good to understand the, the need which was um, exposed some, I think maybe already 15 years ago, to bring in the knowledge and collections from the West. And mm -hmm. Juliette Singer, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the Louvre Abu Dhabi. It was opened last year. Um, so give us an insight. Okay, thank you. Coming up. Okay, so I'm very happy to be here with my colleagues. Uh, we share the same office for a long time. Uh, but uh, we are the first museum to, to open. There are many, many uh, projects in uh, Sadi at Island, but you can see the, the beautiful uh, building from Jean Nouvel. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. The, the, uh, yeah. Yeah. Ah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Sorry. So I will not say again what my colleague did say, but you can see. So the first one uh, looked at the Louvre Abu Dhabi. Uh, the story starts uh, ten years ago with uh, the signature of a very of uh, intergovernmental agreement between the UAE and French government. So you can see the first picture. It was the start of a very big adventure because it was not so easy to find the connection and to build such a project because uh, it was, uh, it involved uh, 17 different uh, structures in France. Uh, we have some loans from uh, 13 museums in, from Louvre, but also from Musée d'Orsay, Musée du Quai Branly, Pompidou Center and seven, uh, 17 uh, structures. And so the first acquisition was a Mondrian in uh, 2009. Then I will be quick. Uh, but so uh, finally, there are many exhibitions like Birth of the Museum in Louvre. Maybe you saw it. And then we opened um, in, uh, in uh, last November with a great uh, success. We were very happy. There were uh, 700 journalists that came and uh, a lot of press and nice people coming. It was a big, big festivities and we were <laughs> all very happy with uh, all that festivities. Uh, so the um, museum, why can we say it's a universal museum first? Because it's the structure itself. It's made for people to, to go all together under uh, a dome. And the dome was the idea of Jean Nouvel. Jean Nouvel, uh, maybe you know him, He's a <laughs> famous architect and uh, he, he likes to, to work in a context, you know, to understand the country, to understand the place. So he decided to build a building very um, uh, with a good condition to be involved in the context of Abu Dhabi. Uh, so he decided not to do it on the earth, but to be surrounded by the water and to to build a very big dome. And the dome, it's like, you know, a canopy. So when you are under the dome, you have the feeling that you are under the, the you can see some rain of light, you will see some picture. And it's like also a Medina. So the inside the museum, it's like a small city with some streets. So it's a place where people uh, are invited to come and to cross and there is a real life. It's like a world in, in the museum. So you can see now the museum, uh, how it is. It's surrounded by water with a big, bigger structure. The dome is uh, heavy like maybe the Eiffel Tower. It's made with eight different levels, but it's in open air. But it was very complicated for the engineer to find the way. Uh, it can be against the wind, against the, the, it's very hot in the summer. It can be even uh, 40 degrees in the, the heat of the <laughs> summer. 
and the sound and so, so it, it's very a masterpiece uh, in terms of, uh, in term of uh, architectural uh, structure. So during the night, you can see, it's uh, like uh, 8,000 stairs because it's all that uh, diversity of holes and lights and with that beautiful water. So, so you can see the small, um, the small street inside and in the white uh, buildings, it is actually the permanent collection. So it's in the very perfect condition for the works. The works now, uh, we show about uh, 600 uh, works. 3,000 are loans, loans from the museum, French museum, but also from um, museum like Alain or museum of different state of UAE, also for Jordani, also from Saudi Arabia. So it's a very good implantation in the Arabic uh, context also. So that it is changing all the day and during the night. So you, you really have to come to see it. <laughs> And so we have also some um, contemporary commission. This is one, a wall made with Jenny Holzer, an American artist, and she chose to make uh, big walls uh, with three different languages. And this one is taken from Montaigne, uh, a thinker about the Renaissance, and it's about the tolerance. And tolerance, it's a big uh, word, uh, big. Um, of big importance in Louvre Abu Dhabi as a universal museum. It is also to show the openness. Uh, the UIE um, have, uh, of course, Emirati people, but also 190 different nationalities. So people who visit the museum are coming from abroad, but even inside the museum, 190 different nationalities. It shows that you have really to, to speak to anyone and to be understood understood ever by any anybody and so that start with a permanent collection with the permanent galleries this is a great vestibule so the great vestibule as you can see uh, the showcase was were made by Jean Nouvel also so it's like iceberg and on the floor there is like uh, the map of the coast of Abu Dhabi to, to, to show that it always have been a place of uh, crossroads actually because of the sea, because of the desert and so. So even now it is a crossroads with a hub of airport and thanks to the museum it's a place where all the countries are represented. And in, in those showcases you can see sorry, uh, some masterpieces and in that very first place you can see uh, in different showcases three pieces coming from different places but it's like they showed common points, common links between different uh, parts of the world. And uh, for example, the maternity, you know, a woman with a child, it's quite universal. You can see in any, any place from, Ch from uh, not China here, but I'm uh, China also, but in Europa or in uh, Egyptia or in uh, Africa, you have, you have such uh, images, but it's also about the death, about, about the water. So it is to show the philosophy of the museum, it's more to focus on the common point than to the points that are um, differences, yeah. Mm -hmm. So then the permanent collection starts with uh, the first uh, villages and uh, it's from the very prehistorical time until now. So it's a loop because you can do it also in the, in the other uh, way. But it's maybe in the middle, maybe the oldest um, representation of humanity, uh, 8,000 uh, years old. It's coming from Jordani, and it's very strange when you look at that. At that, you feel it very. It looks very contemporary. It's like a double, you know, double heads, and uh, they are staring at you, and it's you have the feeling to 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 be projecting in the times, and it's very strong. And then you can see all the um, collection is chronological, but also thematic, and always about the different uh, things that happen in the same times in the world. And this is, for example, the, about the universal religion. And especially you, are, you have those showcase with one Koran, one Stora, one Bible. And it's, it is a very first time that you can see 
in a universal museum in a radical uh, area, it's a very strong uh, message also to see that anyone, and with education and school and so, anyone can come and see the different books and uh, learn more about the religion and what happened in different uh, cultures and other countries. So La Belle Ferronnière, the Bologne of Louvre. So you can see different uh, places. The Mondrian was the first acquisition. It was uh, from the Yves Saint Laurent, Yves, uh, Pierre Berger, Yves Saint Laurent uh, collection. Here you have uh, Roscoe, but also an El Saadi. It's a loan from a Guggenheim collection. Also a Raza. So you can see the difference of the, of the collection. And so, um, that's yeah, a very quick presentation, but if you have some questions. Thank you so much. I think the, the main question for this first panel is, is I, th I think, extremely important, because, Rin, you said we try to make it post-colonial in our, in our approach, in our way of thinking. And I was just wondering if that was the same sort of background for you and for you in the museum concept to make it a more balanced way of, of looking at the development of art in the world. I don't think it's to make it balanced, but this is reality, this is history. We were connected to cultures, we were connected to the East and to the West, and I think we are fortunate that we are in the middle of the world, like the East and the West, and we're connected to uh, to uh, India, to Iran, to Yemen, and there are a lot of similarities even when you go to, for example, the coins that I showed, like Roman coins or Islamic coins or things like that. The, the, there was a human uh, civilization that were connected, but how did that happen thousands of years ago without Instagram or Twitter, or how did they see the style of a Roman uh, emperor clothing and then uh, have a similar one in India so it, it's fascinating that there was a connection for thousands of years ago, and, and this is still happening until today with the, the world of culture, diplomacy, and soft power, as we just mentioned earlier. So yeah, this is human history. And Juliette, was that the same sort of philosophy behind uh, the Louvre Abu Dhabi that you are saying we're going to present those cultures in the sort of same rank? <laughs> yes, and I think uh, it's about um, there are not one center, there are, it's a polyfocal uh, world now, and we are speaking about globalization, mm -hmm. I mean, it's a global world, and it's okay, we say it again and again, but everyone is speaking about where it is from, and so I think it's good to, to understand the different scale mm -hmm. on how the exchanges are uh, possible, also about the heritage of everyone, mm -hmm. so I think it's... Yeah. So you came in with the Western eye, so to say, was it something you have to had to adapt to change? But what was it that you had to do to become more, how you say, universal in your approach? I think it's interesting because I'm coming from the French Museum, and in France you have first uh, Louvre that stopped at uh, in 1848. Then you have Musée d'Orsay. Then you have Pompidou Center. If you want to see African works, you go to uh, Quai Branly and so. So in that museum, what you have to do is to try to mix everything and to understand how it's make understand the whole story of humanity. Mm -hmm. And so that is a challenge and it's a new way maybe to show things, to, to make things all together and to, to change the way to show them and, and the approach is totally different. Well, this is about the historical presentation and to, to make it more, as you say, globalized. But Reem is also working on the very edge of the now, and she makes it also very political. Is that something you think is also possible to bring in into a balanced way? Is that is that possible? Of course, and yes, it's not here, but in the in the guide, uh, you mm. can see some. For example, in the contemporary art, I, I am in charge more of that. So at the end, you have works from Omar Ba, who is a Senegalese artist, speaking about all that uh, disorder uh, in the Africa because of that story. You have aussi, you have also, sorry, uh, Abdullah El Saadi coming from uh, uh, Korfakan. You have also Mahamalou, she's a Saudi artist. 
You have also uh, Duncan Wiley from Zimbabwe speaking about the problem of water. So on, in the middle, you have a work of Aiwewei. It's like a Babel Tower. Just to show that now, of course, there are some problematics and we have to try to deal with that and to find the way to all to be together, even if we don't have to say there are not uh, some political issue or economical or uh, environmental issue. So we have to have to face that and to try to make it to build something new and okay. positive. Salama, is that also something you are able to do in your museum to make to use art in a more political sense? Um, well, I think you, you can't escape from politics <laughs> wherever you go, but we like to say it's cultural diplomacy, I think, more than politics. For example, uh, and throughout the program, and not only in Zaire National Museum, but also in the different projects that we're working on. For example, just recently we finished the Culture Summit as well, we spoke about it. We had uh, people visiting that summit from 50 different countries. Uh, we have the Abu Dhabi Art Fair, which uh, also invites 50 different galleries, international galleries, uh, but also the more heritage projects, for example, um, uh, we have different uh, historical sites like Qasr al Mawaji and all of that. But also there are other institutions, for example, that we work with internationally and regionally. We had exhibitions with Spain, we had exhibitions with Saudi Arabia, we had exhibitions with, uh, we have collaborations with Oman, with um, India, with Egypt, France, United Kingdom. So really for the past, um, I say since, well, personally, I joined the Department of Culture and Tourism in Abu Dhabi nine years ago. So I have been encountered with as many cultural institutions and, and, um, and platforms, and it's, it's really, uh, it's, I think we're very lucky to, all of us actually, Reem as well, we all worked in Abu Dhabi and we all had a taste of, of that. So it's all coming up together, I think. So Reem, uh, we, we see now we face a lot of stereotyped perspective in the West regarding the Arab world. Uh, a lot connected to negative connotations. Um, is it something you can do as a curator to, to, make that, to make that shift, to make that change, both in the Arab world and the museum you work there and in the West? Um, I have to answer this diplomatically <laughs> <laughs> and say it's, it's not up to me to change what the West wants to think about us. I think it's up to the West to, to, to decide that it's about time to change the way they think about us. Okay. So it's not my role. I think I represent a very rich culture that is very colorful, that is diverse, that has always been tolerant of religions mm -hmm. and of ethnicities and of various backgrounds and has always been open and open borders. And I think that's part of our problem. We were easily colonized that way because we were so hospitable. We didn't see it coming. And, um, and I think that that is not, so I think that kind of outlook in terms of our culture needs to be absorbed from a different culture that unfortunately is still thinking about accumulation of wealth as an importance, as closing borders, as uh, thinking about, um, let's say, uh, profiling. There's a lot of racism. Um, so that is something that the West needs to contend with. Okay. Let that set the stage for our second panel talk. Thank you so much. <laughs> Give them a big hand. Thank you. Um, we will go back to our musical intermezzo, I think. Um, and that's the Amsterdam and the Lutheran Orchestra. So may I invite you, gentlemen, to uh, have the floor. I'll be back in a second. I'll be back in a second. So I have to. Thank you. 
الله 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 لما ناداني الله الله لما ناداني الله الله بنوري سبني الله الله بنوري سبني عرفت الهوى مذ عرفت هواك عرفت الهوى مذ عرفت هواك وأغلقت قلبي على من عداك وأغلقت قلبي على من عداك وقمت أناجيك يا من ترى وقمت أناجيك يا من ترى خفايا القلوب ولسنا نراك خفايا القلوب ولسنا نراك الله الله لما نادني أحبك حبين حب الهوى أحبك حبين حب الهوى وحبا لأنك أهل لداك وحبا لأنك أهل لداك فأما الذي حب الهوى فشغلي بذكرك عمن سواك وأما الذي وأنت أهل الله فكشفك للحجب حتى أرى فلا الحمد لي ولا ذاك لي فلا الحمد في ذا ولا ذاك لي ولكن لي الحمد في ذا وذاك ولكن لك الحمد في ذا وذاك الله الله لما ناداني الله الله لما ناداني الله الله بنوري سبني الله الله بنوري سبني الله 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 ربي الله 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 ربي الله 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 ربي 
عوني وحاسبي ملي سواه الله 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 ربي جل علاه الله الله لك من نعمة علي كم لك من نعمة علي الله الله كم لك من نعمة علي ولم تزل محسنا إلي الله الله ولم تزل محسنا إلي الله 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 ربي الله 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 ربي الله 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 ربي عوني وحاسبي ما لي سواه الله 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 ربي جل علاه الله 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 ربي الله 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 ربي الله 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 ربي عوني وحاسبي ما لي سواه الله 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 ربي جل علاه الله الله The Amsterdam Andalusian Orchestra, thank you so much. And uh, we will have uh, them again at the end of the session. Thank you. Um, so please, uh, I will introduce you to our second uh, panel. And um, we will have uh, the two ladies we just have uh, heard already. So may I please ask you both to sit in the chairs again. And um, then Achim Borja Jum, he's from, uh, originally from Germany. He's a German art curator. And he's right now the director of exhibitions at the Tate and previously has uh, been a curator of modern and contemporary art in Tate Modern. So give him a big hand, Ajim Borchert Jung. <laughs> yes, please. And for the Dutch audience, I think it's also good uh, to uh, introduce for the more international guest, uh, Wim Pijbes, a Dutch art historian and Emeritus General Director of the Rijksmuseum. So Wim, please. The last chair is yours. Achim, we start with a small presentation on your site, and then we will hopefully uh, debate it a little bit more in depth with the panel. Go ahead. Okay. I try to be as small as I can be. Um, it's probably not quite true. Um, so just um, at some speed to go straight in, there, there are two terms which I would really like to pick up on, which uh, Reem mentioned actually in her presentation, which is um, stories and material containers. And perhaps to think about the museum, as a place that is um, in itself a material container for quite a number of stories. And I try to pick up on a register um, of those that have something to do with the theme of um, this session. Key to which perhaps is that operating in two languages most of my life, um, one of the particular things about English is that it makes a distinction between history and story. So between what is allegedly fact and what is fiction and that history has a sort of strange gendering between towards uh, his story, and instead of which I would like to talk about quite a number of different stories. So um, to give an example, oh, we're already there. Um, I'm almost at home. Uh, this is one of the collection displays. You're opening to a suite uh, of collection galleries called uh, Artist and Society, and in this room we can see on the left um, a series of images by Rachel Whitreed that show um, a group of tower blocks in Hackney in the eastern of London being pulled down in the 1990s, um, a site of great social tension. And this is paired with a sculpture by um, Marwan Rashmaroui, an uh, um, artist from um, Lebanon who also spent some time in the US. And the sculpture is inspired by Burj Amour or the infamous sniper tower in the center of Beirut 
which was the site of um, atrocious violence because it was used during the Civil War um, as a place um, from which you could, from hiding, um, shoot at the other side across the um, Green Line. So in a way, what both of these works do is that they take a form of modernist architecture and present it as a site of great social and political um, conflict. So there is a connection there, and that in a way is a running theme. So what connects people in all their differences? I would be highly, personally highly suspicious of the term universal because I appreciate difference as much as I um, appreciate um, similarity. So in terms of these um, stories and how they connect, just to give a few more examples. <coughs> this is a work which we recently acquired by um, Farid Balkair, who is an artist from um, Morocco. The work is called Cuba C, which may sound slightly surprising. It has a Spanish title. It's actually a work about the, um, that alludes to the Bay of Pigs crisis in the uh, 1960s when the U.S. forces tried to land in Cuba and were um, pushed back by revolutionary forces under Fidel Castro. And Becaia wanted to express his solidarity with the um, cause of the um, Cuban Revolution. He was an artist born in Morocco who moved to Paris, had very first-hand experience of European modernism, moved on to um, Prague, spent some considerable time there, before eventually he connected with Latin America and returned to Morocco. And this is sort of a very typical story of how artists and ideas travel just as most of us do, and it's not a new thing either. If you take another example, the uh, sculptor Pavis Tanavoli and the sculptor The Poet and the Beloved of the King, um, it um, refers to actually a couple of lovers, Shirin and Farad, um, who are protagonists in the um, Shaname, which is a national poem of um, Iraq, and uh, of Iran, sorry, and Tanavoli is an artist associated with what is called spiritual pop or new traditionals in um, Iran, and who sought to integrate votive sheet folk art into um, their modern, modernist practice. And this meeting of two different uh, universes of ideas again, is something which is completely common to the history of modernity. Um, the moment one pays attention to the specifics of any one of us, most of these stories are made up of multiple stories. Marwan um, is another artist who illustrates it very beautifully in a way that is actually quite uh, curious to me because I grew up in uh, Germany, as you may have uh, <laughs> gathered. Um, and um, having grown up at a time where neo-expressionism was um, the big uh, thing and the heroes of German art were people like Georg Baselitz and suddenly you come across an artist um, who um, uh, comes from a completely different context, born in Damascus, uh, so Syrian, but comes to Germany, studies with Schoenberg exactly as uh, Baselitz did. There are two artists in um, conversation around uh, the value of figurative art, and they're fine to a painterly idiom which has um, clear particular um, forms and expressions, but clearly also has shared ground. And finally, just in terms of works of art, but just because it's interesting so that, again, we, we, we uh, stick to the, uh, this idea of ideas traveling but not uh, everything melting into one, is uh, Dia Lazari. Um, and this is a painting that depicts the um, Sabra and Shatila massacre in Beirut, which was one of the most um, atrocious uh, scenes of killing during the civil war when uh, militia forces um, came into a Palestinian uh, camp and uh, under the uh, or with the uh, endorsement of the uh, Christian Lebanese and the um, Israeli forces, um, killed a great many um, Palestinians. And this is by a painter who actually in 1976 moved to London, so has actually been living on our doorstep for most of his um, artistic career. The story can carry on. So we can do this in contemporary art. Uh, there's Wild Shorky, Cabaret Crusades, uh, a work that tells the history of the Crusades from the Arab perspective. Akram Zatri, Dance to the End of Love, a work made up from uh, found footage on um, YouTube. All of it is to say that this conversation between uh, different um, 
people in particular regions and across regions is in a way the state of normality. And that's also the way how we present these works in our collection. So this is a room about uh, the city. And on the floor you can see another um, uh, work by Marwan Rashmaroui, uh, um, cultured map um, or rubber map of uh, Beirut. Um, and you can walk on the city. And I had a very curious encounter there because I, uh, we have a sort of system whereby all of us are invited to give short presentations to the public. You just pop up and you talk for 10 minutes. I did this about this work and suddenly there were people in the audience who uh, said this, they, they came from there. Their house was on the wrong side of the green line and this was the first time that they reconnected again in a way with those uh, memories in a neutral space in the gallery. And here it's shown together with works by Boris Mikhailov and uh, Mark Bradford, so about Ukraine and LA, arguably, and Kada Adzia. Um, so a broad range. All of which is to say there's a great many shared preoccupations in contemporary society, and uh, I think that all these stories in the end connect. A um, couple more examples, how this filters into exhibition program, which is principally my area. Um, so I think if you think of the DNA of the museum as first having a collection, so it's a container to preserve something, a physical memory, um, that uh, collection gets displayed, so stories are being told, and within that context exhibitions are being made, and these exhibitions in a way tell stories very loudly and in a very articulate way that otherwise may be more quietly embedded into objects. So there were two exhibitions, just to pick them up, because they had to do with, uh, particularly with uh, the region. We're talking about uh, Salwa Raula Shakir in 2013, an artist uh, from uh, Lebanon, from Beirut, fantastic uh, sculptor. The, the figurative self-portrait is actually rather exceptional. And uh, Farinis Azeit um, and Reem is actually wearing Farinis Azeit uh, <laughs> from Tate, which is uh, brilliant. Um, and again, another artist who nationality is hard to define, just like my own. Um, Iraqi, Turkish, uh, had lived in Paris, uh, Berlin, a truly international existence. But what I thought was particularly interesting also is that histories of remembering are also always histories of forgetting. So I just uh, discovered last week a beautiful Furnace Azade painting from 1959 in a collection in the north of England, in Bradford, and it was bought in 1965. So at some point, clearly, connections existed, and this work was very well known, um, deemed worthy of purchase by a public collection, but then it, was, it got forgotten. And so now we talk about these great discoveries, but actually they are so slightly um, circular. Um, the circularity, to have another example, Tarek Atui, who was part of our opening displays when we opened uh, the New Tate Modern in 2016. Tarek lives between Beirut and uh, Paris, and actually this performance that he made on this very curious uh, instrument you can see on the right. Those instruments are inspired by his research into the uh, collection of uh, musical instruments in the museum in Dahlem in uh, Berlin. And so he took what had been, in a way, brought into a national German collection from all over the world and began to reimagine it, again, in a different way for these objects to travel. They were used in uh, Mexico City after Berlin and then came to um, London. We heard about the, um, the famous global, so how the global connects to the um, local. This is a work by Bushra um, Uzgen, Corbo, which we performed last uh, year at uh, Tate Modern. It was 10 women from Morocco and 10 um, local women. Um, they are in a procession together and occasionally they make a very piercing um, sound. Uh, this was part of Shubak, which is a festival to celebrate Arabic uh, culture in um, London. All of which is to say that what we talk about as being very far away also is on our doorstep. Many of these people live on our doorstep. Um, nearly there. Um, how it sort of filters out in a slightly bigger way. We used to have a program um, called the Project Space, which was the idea that we would work um, with a grassroots organization, with a smaller organization elsewhere in the world. Um, this happened in many different parts of the world. 
Um, but out of the ones that were um, worth mentioning, because they again relate to this context, we did a project with Dara Afanun in Amman, uh, St. Jordan. We did one with uh, Kabul uh, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, we worked with uh, SALT in Istanbul, um, sadly no longer really functioning, which is a great shame, and with uh, CRC in uh, Cairo. And this basically fosters relationships, and the relationships are really important. So just as much as the stories are in the works, it is about relationship between people. Um, and those people are the people who work in the museum, so every one of us as individuals, not just as institutional spokespeople, and meeting people in other parts of the world and building really friendships and relationships and beginning to learn something about each other and what our different contexts are and how we could possibly work together. So it's not so much about big institutional policy as about actually personal exchange. Uh, Many places one can do that, uh, like uh, the dreaded marketplace or fairs like Art Dubai, but they are very important uh, hubs um, in any part of the art world. Places like the Sharjah Art Foundation, which does amazing work, um, not just during the Sharjah uh, Biennial, but around the year. We heard about uh, other museums. Forums like Home Base in Beirut, everywhere where people come together to talk about the pressing issues of the time. Infrastructure building is important, learning about expertise. We did a program with uh, Oman to help the museum, um, well, to help museum is, is a funny way, to uh, provide, in a way, uh, expertise and uh, knowledge that we have because we happen to work in an organization a structure that has existed for a long time. And we're really talking nuts and bolts now, not just great ideas, but registrars, uh, conservators, how to really deal with all these material repositories of uh, storytelling. Um, so this was one scheme. And then finally, just to conclude, in terms of that it isn't just only about the institution, but the people within it, I wanted to mention one last uh, project, which um, actually a younger colleague of mine did, uh, an assistant curator, Vasilis Akonopoulos, who this year curated an exhibition in Jeddah as part of the Jeddah Arts Summit. All of which is to say that I think in many ways, actually the situation is very similar as anywhere else around the world, which is that it relies on networks in every possible way to build ideas and connections, but always with the appreciation, I think, of our individual um, particular situations and um, circumstances. And if anything, perhaps, engaging with the wider world should make us aware that our center isn't quite as solid either as we might have um, believed or been taught to think. That's it. I think, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, have, uh, have a glass and a chair. Um, maybe just to, to, to understand, was this a sort of moment in time decided by you or the museum that there should be a more broader way of, of, of presentation and collecting than just European mm -hmm. modern art? Or was it just already happening even before you came into the museum? Well, it certainly was happening before I came to the museum. Um, but uh, I think... There's a um, force field of circumstances. So when Tate Modern uh, was started, which was 17 years ago that it opened, or 18 years ago now, um, relatively new museum, one of the most common criticisms labeled was that it now was a great building, but a very patchy collection. And it made no sense to try and um, collect the collection as if the, the way it may have been collected had it been collected 50 or 60 years earlier. Um, if you put that together with what the actual situation of London was, which is um, continues to be a booming um, global city for quite a number of reasons to do with the uh, deregulation of the financial markets, um, various different uh, reasons, English as a language, uh, it's got a a lot of airports, it's easy to go in and out, uh, um, quite a number of stuff. It, it became quite clear that in a way for the museum to connect to the situation it finds itself in, 
it made no longer sense to go back and try and collect a Western canon as such. And I think the final thing which is important is that Britain, in a way, if you take the European canon, was always a marginal place. Um, mostly when you talk to people from uh, uh, France or from New York, and you talk about British art, they think it's a little bit um, regional. <laughs> so we share some of the... Uh, so, so Wintab, is maybe you can, also can, can bring us a little bit back to the moment the, the, the Rijksmuseum reopened. Was there also a sort of in, in, uh, internal debate about what is the scope we are going to look at the world? And is this a different scope than it used to be when you looked at the museum in the late, late, late 80s, uh, early 90s? Yeah. Um, well, the scope of the museum always starts with the collection. And since the collection of the Rijksmuseum as the national museum has been very, very much focused on the Netherlands, um, has always been. So in a way that's very limited to, let's say, this, well, this small country. And at the same time, um, since the Netherlands has many uh, historical connections with several parts of the world, colonial or not, but um, let's say 80% or maybe 90% of the collection is Dutch. And um, well, the good thing is it's very good art. I mean, there are many good painters in, in the Netherlands and many good art pieces being made here. Um, but in a way, it's, it's the same thing as the Tate Modern. I mean, the Tate Modern was when it opened in, in 2000. It's what you say, a patchy collection. So it's not a, a coherent collection to tell the story of modern art. There were many gaps. So what Tate did, Tate Modern did, I'll come back to, to the Rijks Museum, but what Tate Modern did, they made from their weakness their strength. What they did is to, to tell the story of art, not in that uh, typical chronological, art historical way, surrealism, Dadaism, etc., cubism, etc. No, they, they decided to make it, to open it up, and to open up the collection uh, in, in, in a way they, they, they displayed the, the collection in, in themes like form and color, or city and landscape, or the human body, or uh, themes like that. So everybody could relate to that collection. So you, and, and the weakness of the collection was in a way uh, hidden or was, was, was not so important because you, you went there and you saw beautiful works of art because there are beautiful works of art. And it was a complete new way of displaying what you have. Well, in the Rijksmuseum, that's a different story. I mean, we have to bring and to show the Rembrandts and the Vermeers and the Steins and the, the, whole, the whole stuff. So that's okay. But at the same time, we felt that in 2013, we live in different times than in 1885, uh, when this building as a kind of cathedral for, for national heroic uh, gallery of honor, and at the end you have the high altar with the night watch by Rembrandt. I mean, this whole building is, is made... To, to celebrate nationalism and to celebrate Rembrandt. Well, that concept is, is not longer uh, valid. So, um, and we have Islamic art, we have, well, we, I'm not longer any, uh, the director, but the Rijksmuseum have international connections. I mean, there is French art and there is British art and there is German art. So what, uh, what we did in the Rijks is that there is Dutch art on every, on every floor. And in the corners, we have this international connection rooms. So if you go there, you have this chronological display, Middle Ages, 17th century, 18th century, 19th century, 20th century. And in every corner, you see that this Dutch art is connected to what's going on in the world. And I think, um, yeah, sorry to say it, as that, that we found a very clever way to, to, to make this Dutch art um, connected to what's happening in the world. So that's, that, that's the way we did it. Okay. But the collection is, is leading. I see. Yeah. Achim, uh, I asked Reem before, what should, the, in a way, the West's perspective do in regards to what's happening right now, the sort of closing borders, the, the, the realm of nationalism? And then she said, well, that's up to the Western Museum. It's not, that's not my problem, in a way. What do you consider to be the most important uh, uh, thing you have to do as a as a director. I think it's, I, I think so. In my, in my view, what I think is the most important, um, the most pressing uh, agenda, 
is to really understand that this idea that there is our history and then there is something else, some other history, just isn't true. It doesn't hold anymore. Um, you will have to find ways how to bring this together as um, deeply connected, shared, in a way, uh, I guess, if you talk about the history of colonialism, you, ca you can't present the achievements of Western culture and think that whatever happens elsewhere in the world is something else, and you put it into a different pocket. But I think the interesting thing would be, and we have a lot of conversations around this, is that I think uh, nobody is actually particularly interested anymore in a sort of culture of calling out or uh, shaving or guilt. But the much greater challenge is actually how do you learn to understand that this both sides may be your history. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a common history. Yes. Yeah. Should it, it's yeah. sometimes said that even the concept of the museum itself means redefinition because it's a sort of a Western concept. How do you look upon that? Um, the story of the museum is quite uh, not, um, it's not usual because first the Emirati government wanted a museum so he asked uh, architect to build a museum then he asked a team to make the collection so we are not in that mm. uh, case. We don't have to, to, to go from a collection there that freedom to create the collection. It's a freedom, it's, it's also complicated because you have to, to find things interesting in the market and also to, to, to create something new. So that is why, of course, we have to think about the, the world and so we are sure we will make some mistakes, but we are trying to, to have uh, enough uh, wide vision to try not to be with that old stories. It's a very big challenge to make a new museum in a new country. Mm -hmm. UAE, uh, it's just born in 1971. Uh, even if it's, they have a very long story, of course, with archeology span and a very long story before, the, the country is young and it's a very powerful thing to, to, to create that and it's very, you become much more optimistic because you think it's, uh, the trust in the culture to build something peaceful and a common way to, to speak all together. So we have that in mind and we are trying to do something like that. So you also that say it's an advantage to be in a young country because it's more positively orientated than maybe when you're already sitting yes. on, on, on thousand years of, of, of layered national history. We, we feel that in the, in mm -hmm. the team, of cur in the curatorial team, I okay. think it's is that also the sort of freedom, Salama, you, you, you faced? The fact that you really can work without any sort of border because it's still in, in, in the face of building up, it's a young mm -hmm. sort of tradition? Um, well, yes, I mean, I, I agree uh, with uh, Juliet, but also uh, prior the Saadiat Island museums, there were also other museums that existed in the UAE, in the other Emirates, in Alain City, a lot of historical sites that are open for visitors as well in Alain, uh, a lot of forts and palaces as well. But the idea, the idea of processes and policies is new, I can say. But the idea of preserving and culture and history is way back, even before the, f the formation of the United Arab Emirates in 1971. Yeah. So, but I think we are fortunate to have this, um, chance today to, to build a collection, uh, not following a tradition way, but to create new type of museums and to create new typologies of museum that match the 21st century. So Wim, I know you are now working on a new sort of museal concept. Is it also for you possible to have this sort of open mind to, to, to sort of, well, get rid of the old uh, or already uh, sort of uh, organized ideas? How do you do that? Yeah, we, uh, we're working on an exhibition, or not an exhibition, but a, on a place that I won't call a museum, but in a place where the story of immigration and will be told. And we start from scratch. We have a building and we have a budget and we have storylines that we want to tell. And uh, so we, we're going now looking to places where they are in the same position. So we went to Washington the other day where this, uh, on the mall, 
this National Museum for African American uh, Arts and Culture is built uh, recently, and they started also from scratch. They have no collection. Uh, they wanted to tell, to tell this story, and at the same time, they did not want to compete with the existing museums, so they had the advantage of starting from scratch, and also they had the problem starting with scratch, because if you're on the mall in Washington, well, you have to, to bring a strong uh, a strong museum with a, with a great collection. And they started, um, in a way, collecting their objects, strong objects that could represent stories. And what they did, and I think that's a very clever way, it's, um, and they, they looked at what the, what the BBC does, uh, the Antique Roadshow, and in Holland there's the same kind of program, Kunst and Kitsch. So they did, in all the states of the US, they did a kind of antique roadshow, and they asked people to bring in uh, objects that were relevant to tell the story of African-American history. Mm. Um, and they asked, uh, okay, if you are thinking of, of, of presenting it, donating it to a museum, please think of our museum to do so. And if not, you can also donate it to a local museum or any other museum. But please, this is what we are, this is what we want to tell, and if you think your object could be relevant for us, we are happy to take it in. So, and they did that for about two or three years, and they amassed an enormous collection uh, of beautiful objects, and that, that makes what the collection of the museum now is, and it's, it's from day on, that from day one, it's an instant success. I mean, it's, it's incredible. So, yes, you can do uh, you can bring, uh, you can start a museum from scratch and bringing in new objects that are relevant for, for this 20, 21st century to, to bring cultures or to bring cultures and people together. I mean, that's the, the, the theme of this, of this panel. So, yeah, um, that, that's good. That's I mean, but, but, but that's, uh, don't, it won't work for the Rijksmuseum, but it could work for, for, for museums uh, in, in the in Qatar, Abu Dhabi, or we, we've been working with museums in, in Qatar, where the, same hap where the same thing happens. I mean, beautiful buildings, uh, budgets, I mean, there is a budget in those places, uh, but no collection. So how to start? Yeah, that, that's a really challenge. Uh, okay, one question for Achim. Uh, what, what do you think? Uh, there, there is this sort of debate of, among musea to, to have a more diplomatic role to play as well. And one of your colleagues, uh, Tristan Hunt of the Victoria and Albert said, um, we should reach out much more, especially to the Arab, Arab world. Um, and uh, that is a role we have to play. What do you think about that? Well, the, I think it's, uh, in a way, again, it's, it's something which I think is almost natural and normal because I, I feel like when you, so for me, it's quite, quite curious. If I, if I make program and I think about international collaborations, there are some which I think that it's very easy and obvious. I can do this across uh, mm -hmm. parts of Central Europe. I can do this across uh, the United States. Essentially, why can I do that? Because I probably know the, the people. I have the conversations. I've inherited them when I came into my job. So in, in a way, it's not so unusual to think, well, where do you do that. And I think that the one thing is, and I think this is probably what everybody finds, once you begin to go there, that's certainly what we have found uh, at Tate Modern. It's a little bit like the Rachel Whitefleet uh, photograph. More and more categories begin to collapse because um, all kinds of things which you think are the systems, the rules, the barriers, the frontiers, they won't hold anymore because the, the art history will collapse. Uh, your term terminology will collapse, your uh, definitions of who looks after the canon will collapse, uh, your understandings about uh, where the expertise resides vis-a-vis -vis your audience, it will change. Everything will go into flux. It's a total it, disruptive sort of development. Yeah, it's, it's just an evolution. I mean, I think it is, a, it is a historic structure which is now in the process of acute mm -hmm. evolution just as a nation state is or construct like Europe. Okay, so new stories to tell, new structures which comes, with, which comes within. Um, let's have a possibility for people uh, in the audience to ask some questions and to add something to this, uh, this talk we had so far. Uh, who likes to, uh, to ask a question? Um, yes, over there. Let's see if I can reach you without 
hurting anyone. I give you the mic, but very, very simple. It should be a question, it should be short, and otherwise I come, I come and get it. <laughs> uh, yes, I'll, I'll try. Um, it's in line with, I think, the last things that are being said, because a lot of art theorists and curators, curators now believe that a 21st century museum, a post-colonial museum, is not only a place for showing art, but also for uh, the visitor to, to speak to where cultures, I think, actually meet. And I was wondering if you are thinking about um, projects that actually um, give visitors the chance to speak, and by that sort of losing the authority to speak yourself. Yeah, I, I mean, that's, act, that's totally the time where we live in now. I mean, mm -hmm. big institutions, <coughs> whether if it's, it's, uh, it's a court, ministry, or, <coughs> or a, minister, uh, uh, a museum, a national museum, these automatic um, normal authorities based in the 19th century, universities, newspapers. I mean, we live in time of fake news. We, the world is flat, so everybody is almost equal, it seems. And I think museums should, museums should respond to that dy new dynamics. And that means that no longer the curator is the only person who decides what is on show and what is good or bad or whatever. You, the audience uh, or the visitor, has an opinion and can address this opinion. Uh, the internet, of course, is a very important tool in that. Um, and yeah, museums are no longer in the position to say in their splendid isolation, we decide what beauty or top or not good is no the audience itself can also respond yeah. to that and uh, you see that if in 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 terms of what is on show and <clears throat> and texts in in label a label text for mm -hmm. instance the label text in museums they always have been written from a f from a point of view from curatorial knowledge that and that and that and that but but nowadays you see much more that the visitor wants to know what do I see. There's a much yes. more democratic level mm -hmm. in, 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 in transmitting uh, the works of art and the curator and the audience should much more be on the same level and in this, in, on a discussion level. And that is changing and the, the, the public wants that. Mm -hmm. And if you don't respond in a proper way as an institution or as a curator, then I think that's the end of the story then. I mean, because yeah, you will take over, you as an audience, you as, a, as visitors. I just want to add, uh, sorry, I just want to add on that point as well. So um, in the summer we have an exhibition which the community are the curators. Yes, so like this that. is a chance for the community themselves to create their exhibition and the labels and choose the art and choose the title of the exhibition as well. So this is just one of the initiatives that we are doing in Abu Dhabi to engage the community and for them to speak up and uh, see uh, the world of arts and culture through the eyes of the community. Okay, I mean, maybe just if I can, just to give one third example, just because it's, it's very interesting one, because we, it's uh, same moment, so when we opened the new building, we had handed one floor over to um, what's probably the most innovative part of our work, which is a part called Table Exchange, where we work with about 50, um, organizations, many of which have nothing to do with art. They can be uh, all kinds of, uh, um, from Tourette's to uh, literally all kinds of things. And uh, it's very difficult because we, so we work with these 50 partners and we increasingly hand all the content generation over to them. And they're fully operational, they're fully visible. So as a visitor, you can just stop by and decide whether you want to be part of this or not. And it's very interesting because in institutions, sculptures, it's not, it's structures, it's not so easy to do because people will ask you before and what will the outcome be, what will be, and half the time they, I don't know actually really. Um, but you know, we all thought it's something which we need to try. And it's sort of now in the second year, it's beginning to find its feet. It's quite interesting. And it's again the, the um, appreciation of difference. So I think we are doing our job as curators and 
making displays, but there's actually time, there's space for something completely different in terms of making okay. and discourse generation to that. Room for one other question over there. Let's see if we can reach you uh, fast and properly. Yes, it's possible. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks for the interesting panel. I have a question. I work a lot in China, and you see there a new kind of crossover emerging between museums and all kinds of other uh, forms of commercial, uh, uh, particularly real estate. So you see crossovers between, um, let's say, uh, museums and shopping malls or, or museums and also airports, hotels. Um, I was actually, I want to ask the panel, do you see this as a competition? Do you take it serious? Do you also... Is this a movement that will also come to the West, or is maybe already happening? And um, yeah, that's, that's about it. Can I start with Juliet? Um, actually, I don't think it, there is any competition. It's uh, true that the world of museum is changing and moving, and we are, of course, uh, uh, facing that. But for us, it's important for people to come to the museum, so what is important is for people to understand what is a real work and with authenticity, not fake ones, because you have also some exhibition with uh, uh, fake or things like that. Uh, we also think in a museum you have to take some duration. Uh, I think in China it's always very short and it's moving a lot, and, but I think it's not the same context. It's a huge country with a huge population, and so um, I think we don't have, we are not in competition. We are very happy to, to make uh, Chinese people come to visit the museum. It's, uh, they are coming more and more numerous, also from India and so. But I think Louvre Abu Dhabi, we are not in that situation to be in any competition mm -hmm. with uh, what you are speaking about. It's maybe also a little bit referring to the idea that, that the museum becomes a sort of marketing tool for yeah. developers, huh? Yeah. Is that something you see in other parts of the world as well, or is it typical for China in a way? No, I think also oh. it's, it's part also, for, for, for instance, in any uh, museum. I think it's in France, uh, many people come to the Louvre in Paris or in uh, Abu Dhabi, people come for the cultural scene. And it's also a part of the reality because uh, it's for the... Uh, it's important that people di discover the history, and it's also an economic uh, way to to develop for a country. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I would just say, I, th I think you you have to to degree accept that the uh, um, organization structures, the institution structures, may evolve in different ways in different uh, contexts. Uh, you can have uh, um, national institutions elsewhere which may be more restrictive in their workings than a private institution. Or so I, I think the, um, to, for us at least, the, the key is really a, gen, a genuine kindred spirit. So if we understand the museum as a site to debate a civic society and what it is to live together and uh, what world we want to live in and uh, to have that conversation through looking at art and the history of art, then I think the question of the, the genuine public mindedness is um, really the key decisive factor of whether you feel there's a real connection. Okay, thank you so much. You don't have a question, but you have a remark. So <coughs> let's make that a sort of final thought. Yes. <laughs> I, ke I keep the mic. <laughs> uh, my name is Ronald Mollinger. I used to be a long time ago ambassador in Abu Dhabi, and I know the, the your family, of course. Um, there is somebody not here, but in Abu Dhabi, and you all know her. It's Annabel Burney. Of and course. she put a message this morning on Facebook yes. saying she was in, in the Louvre Abu Dhabi with tears in her eyes. And she said, what I saw there was so unique. This, this kind of... Um, uh, um, uh, enthusiastic way presenting the most beautiful uh, objects of art, like the uh, like the the Da Vinci uh, Napoleon on this uh, horse, uh, and so on. And she wants to send all of you here around her best regards and is advising you to go there very soon because uh, this is a unique place and nobody should miss it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
So I think what you sort of pointed out, and that's, I think, quite a nice thing to end with, is the optimistic view the musea in Abu Dhabi are going to, uh, to, to represent and to show. Maybe some we can learn from in, in Europe. I think there were beautiful examples exchanged about the way we try to wave in uh, the sort of cultural and bicultural understanding of our backgrounds and cultures, mm -hmm. that musea have a task to do that and also to engage in uh, a political debate. I think that was very clear as well. I would like to thank you very much for, uh, for being in the panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that means that we have uh, come to the end of uh, the talking, and we go back to the music. Gentlemen, please. الغصن إذا رأك مقبل سجدا والعين إذا رأتك تخشر غدا يا من بوصالي يداوي الكبدا ما تفعله اليوم تلقاه غدا ما تفعله اليوم تلقاه غدا يا غصن نقاه كلا لم بالذهب أفديك من الردى بأمي وأبي يا غصن نقاه كلا لم بالذهب أفديك من الردى بأمي وأبي إن كنت أسأت في هواكم أدبي العصمة لا تكون إلا لنبي العصمة لا تكون إلا لنبي يا مالك مهجتي ترفق بالله 
لابد لكل عاشق من زل يا مالك موجتي ترفق بالله لابد لكل عاشق من زل روحي تلفت ومهجتي في علا لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله الغصن إذا رآك مقبل سجد والعين إذا رأتك تخشى الرغدا الغصن إذا رآك مقبل سجد والعين إذا رأتك تخشى الرغدا يا من بوصاله يداوي الكبدا ما تفعله اليوم تلقى غدا ما تفعله اليوم تلقى غدا يا غصن نقام كللا بالداب أفديك من الردى بأمي وأبي يا غصن نقام كللا بالذهاب أفديك من الردى بأمي وأبي إن كنت أسأت في أواكم أدبي العصمة لا تكون إلا لنبي العصمة لا 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 تكون إلا لنبي Thank you so much. Thank you. And for all here, um, thank you uh, for being here. I hope you uh, will enjoy uh, the rest of the forum for the upcoming days and uh, have a good uh, uh, weekend. Bye-bye.